So BHAG is the most powerful concept for fundraising I've ever come across in my 25 years as a fundraiser. So Carl's has shared with you the practice and I want, the theory rather, and I want to talk you through the practice. I want to share with you the impact that a BHAG has on a fundraising program. And it all begins almost to the day three years ago. It's not been plain sailing, although it has been extraordinary. And in terms of major giving, a ninefold increase over that period. And last year, our overall fundraising <coughs> grew by 100%. And for me, it's given me that get out of bed and change the world feeling that we all see. So let's start at the beginning. It's my first week at Solar Aid on the fourth day, and we're in a meeting discussing a fundraising event to take place at the end of the summer. It's a <coughs> dinner where a group of influential and, in some cases, wealthy individuals will be gathering. And I can sense the expectation is that because some have money, the, the donations will flow. But as we know, especially on a first date, that's very rarely the case. And I sense something is missing. It's that question Alan was asking earlier. It's why are we bringing these people together? So I ask a question, that naivety of being a new, a new person. What's it all about? What does it add up to? What's our BHAG? And of course, you now know what a BHAG is. And Steve, our chief executive, seizes it immediately. You're right. We need a BHAG. He immediately ambushes a workshop that takes place a week or two later for another purpose. And we gather together a group of key staff, a small group, along with a facilitator from New Philanthropy Capital, to find our BHAG. We talk about great BHAGs, Kennedy's moonshot, uh, the abolition of slavery, even D-Day, I think. And as we walk out of the room, we have our BHAG, and there on the wall was this photograph of the moonshot. So we go, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're in a good place. So, what is our BHAG? It is simply this, to eradicate the kerosene lamp from Africa by the end of the decade. This is a kerosene lamp. This is what most families in Africa use for light. You can see the problem. It's clearly dangerous. Horrific burns due to misbuilt lamps are commonplace in rural villages. It's not good for your health. You can imagine the toxic smoke as a result of this burning wick. If you were to spend a night with a kerosene lamp, you'll wake up with black soot at the end of your nostrils. But the hidden killer is the crippling cost. We now know that kerosene costs a family 15% on average of their household income each week. So now you can see why we wanted to get rid of it. And the solution, the wonderful solar light. It's safe, no risk of burns, it's clean, no emissions, and with the power of the sun that's with us today, sunshine is free. It truly transforms the lives of families in Africa. Children can study at night. It provides people opportunity. Does it fit Carl's checklist? Well, it's a goal. We have a finish line. We do mean by 2020. Boy, is it scary. If Steve, our chief executive, was here, he would say how it drives us every week, every day. And that's why it needs that whole organisation buy-in. And is it ambitious? Does it excite? Well, does it? I have seen how a BHAG has transformed a meeting with a prospect or partner, and, and more about that in a moment. And the final point on this is it lasts. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, but the mission carried on. And whilst our chief executive hasn't been assassinated, um, <laughs> we have reached an extraordinary milestone, our millionth solar light. We are now the biggest distributors of solar lights in Africa. And Steve has decided to step down, to hand the mantle on to someone else to take us towards the next step. 
To eradicate the kerosene lamp from Africa will take 250 million solar lights shining. To achieve a BHAG will require extraordinary effort, and that's why you need it down from the top. But remember, anyone can ask, especially the fundraisers, what's our goal? What's our BHAG? Ask anyone in Solar Aid what's our goal, whether it's the field team in Zambia here or our finance team in London, and they will all say the same answer. <coughs> and it's really the Janet effect at, at work that Carlos referred to. Let me give you an example. It's a Friday, late afternoon, and I've had an email in from David. David doesn't work in fundraising. I even think it's his day off or he's in Africa. And he's told us about an announcement by Google of their Global Impact Award in the UK around this time last year. The, the process to apply is really short. I think it's a couple of weeks. So we get cracking there and then over that weekend about our application. And I'm certain that extra 48 hours has really helped. Maybe we would have picked it up the following week, but it really helps to get cracking on these things. And not only that, I was on leave that following week, and I knew there was one thing, a critical aspect that we had to get right, that we had to make sure our story was in that proposal, that it didn't get lost in the program detail. And I primed our MD, I said, Pepper, whatever you do, don't lose the story. And sure enough, that pressure was there. It always is. And I'm sure it's that story that helped us get shortlisted amongst the many thousands of applications that Google received. I know they had to recruit hundreds of volunteers to go through them. And it undoubtedly helped when we had that pitch in front of the likes of Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Sir Richard Branson. If David hadn't spotted that and alerted us to that opportunity, we wouldn't have started so soon. And I would have had little or no input into it. A BHAG doesn't just help your staff, it helps collaboration too because an organisation can easily see who you are and what it is you do. So currently, we're in discussions with AMREF about the impact of a solar light can have on a midwife in Africa. We're talking to CAMFED about how uh, school leavers could become agents <coughs> selling solar lights. And we're talking to Friends of the Earth about how our campaign and solar lights could inspire school children in this country so they become better <coughs> about solar as well. So, you've got your goal from the top, then you automatically ask yourself, how are we going to achieve it? That question that Steve always pushes to us, what does the BHAG demand? And you need to adapt. I was so taken at the impact a BHAG was having in Solar 8, I decided to set my own. So I just got back from a run and I was sweating rather badly and I thought, right, I've got to do something about this. So, I really did ask myself what would scare me, and at the time I could barely swim a length of a swimming pool. So I thought, right, in nine months' time I'm going to do a triathlon. And that meant a 750 metre open water swim. Okay, what do I need to do? Right, join a swimming class. That wasn't enough, so I fitted in another sweep, uh, swim during the week. That wasn't enough. So I got a one-on-one -on -one tuition. And just when I thought I was making progress, I did my first open water swim. Oh, it was like starting all over again. I could hardly breathe um, because of the murky water and the cold. And the takeout to me was that you constantly review, are you on target to set your goal? And if you're not, you do something to help you get closer. But there will be shocks along the way, like my open water experience. And both our programme and our fundraising have had to adapt. Indeed, our programming uh, area dropped uh, one area of work which brought in more income than anyone else, than anywhere else, and that was installing solar panels on schools and clinics. Um, and that's because it didn't really contribute to the BHAG, because most kerosene lamps are used in households. We also had to adapt our fundraising. We had a, a traditional structure. I was director of fundraising, managing a small team. And our rather disruptive approach didn't really fit traditional funders. I mean, we're, 
we're a charity that owns a company, a social enterprise, which is operational in Africa, when the accepted way is working through local partners, selling solar lights to poor people. So we needed to change. We changed my role. So instead of being a director of fundraising managing a team, I became chief fundraiser. I have no line reports. And it means that I can focus on fundraising. I can spot opportunities. I can use the sum total of my experience, my instinct, if you like. And it really works. And of course, I love it. And, and it's, the reason is bandwidth. Management is important, but it dominates your everyday thinking, staffing issues, recruitment, and so on. And this frees me up. It allows me to roam. It puts me at the front instead of at the back. Um, as a manager. I've even been able to think in the moment and turn rejections around because I've been able to focus on fundraising when others can't. To raise the gap in funds, we focused on three areas. Awards, high net worth individuals, and what we call amplifiers. Now, awards recognise both what you've achieved and your potential. And after a bit of a shaky start, our program team were achieving astonishing results. And with our BHAG, organisations could see what we were striving for, our potential. And so over the course of last year, we won no less than five awards, including the Guardian Sustainable Business Award, uh, the Ashton International Gold Award through the Sainsbury's family, and of course the Google Global Impact Award. High net worth individuals get it. When you can sit opposite someone and explain to them your business-based solution um, for ending poverty, they can, you know, they can see the logic. And our income from major gifts has more than doubled every year from setting that goal, from 75,000 three years ago to 618,000 this last year. And I'm excluding the 300,000 we leveraged through the wonderful UK aid scheme uh, through DFID. By the way, it's only me who focuses on high net worth individuals this year, along with support from Coach Carls here. Um, and we are going to be recruiting later this year, so if you do know anybody. <laughs> and the way to attract those major gifts, well, as Carlos said, engage, engage them. And it creates these amplifiers. The BHAG itself is engaging. I recall telling a major donor, a LAPS major donor, about the BHAG for the first time. And it was our first meeting. It was a coffee in Starbucks. At last, he said, something tangible. And he duly renewed his major gift and has continued since. He's also gone on to engage his networks and helped us um, launch a an appeal in Scotland called Scotland Lights Up Malawi earlier this year in partnership with the Scottish Government. Donors also have helped us frame the campaign. They've helped us develop this initial document to really tighten it and look at the detail. And it's those details that really matter, uh, how you list your financial year and so on. And in doing so, it not only draws them in, it, it encourages them to talk to their network about it. The BHAG is also inspiring. That summer, we had a stand at a festival, a Ben and Jerry's festival, and we nearly didn't do it because these things don't bring in a lot of money and they take a lot of time. But I knew it would be a great place to have fantastic conversations and tell people about our BHAG. A former volunteer comes to our stand because she notices we're there, and Anna tells her about the BHAG for the first time. Three weeks later, Pippa, that's her name, gets in touch and says, I didn't tell you this at the time, but I'm in contact with a family trust. I'm not a trustee, but I could put you forward. She not only put us forward, she wrote the application. And she not only wrote the application, she presented it in front of the trustees, and SolarAid secures one of its largest trust grants in recent years. That's what I mean by an amplifier, people who advocate on your behalf. The story doesn't end there. Um, last year, we needed an interim MD, and Pippa stepped forward, and Julie uh, led our team. The BHAG has even led to failure funding. To achieve such an audacious and scary goal, you will need try to try things that will stretch you. 
So we put forward a proposal to a new prospect to fund our innovation unit, Sunny Money Brains. And not only did they give us a major gift, in doing so, they said, I expect most of these ideas to fail. We now send them an annual failure report. <laughs> and they've renewed that gift ongoing. Every week we ask, what does the BHAG demand? And although it constantly pushes us, every day, it takes time. The BHAG we defined in a workshop, but the story and the narrative behind that took the best part of a year to refine, and another year to sort of <coughs> test out. It took us a year to develop our business plan for our social enterprise, which we call Sunny Money, to sell and distribute 50 million solar lights by the end of the decade. By the way, we sell solar lights rather than give them away because it's so much more effective. It's better for the customer and it spreads quicker. And it's what the BHAG demands. Now, the astute amongst you may recall that to achieve our goal will require 250 million solar lights shining across Africa. So right now, SolarAid is developing its strategy. How do we share our business model? How do we ensure that the other 80% 